smashed myself in the two front teeth with it, and it was extremely loud and extremely painful. But compared to that, I think we're doing good so far, yeah? Yes. Okay, amazing. Do you guys watch YouTube? Yes. yes, raise your hand if you do. Very cool. Wow, we are not losing YouTube. Well, basically, I have a really interesting job where once a week I set up a camera in front of my window and I sit in front of it and I talk about really personal, vulnerable topics, anything as far as like mental health goes from depression, anxiety, disordered eating, body image stuff, uh, sexual assault, emotional abuse, any and all the things. I sit in front of a camera and I talk about that and then I edit the video and I post it up on the internet for anyone to watch it if they wanted to. And when I'm not doing that, I'm writing books and blog posts and social media posts about the same topics, and then again, I am editing them, posting them, publishing them for the world to read if they wanted to. So why do I do that? Why do I make my life so personal and accessible for anyone else to be a part of? You see, I believe that no matter what it is you want to do with your life, whether that is be a singer or a speaker or a doctor or a teacher, I believe that you have to know why you want to do what you want to do in order for it to really fulfill its purpose. And so it is my belief that real authentic friendship, conversation, connection about how we're actually feeling and what's actually going on in our lives versus the pretty painted version that's really easy to share. I believe that that and then holding space for one another in that of empathy and love and compassion that is what is going to change the world. So it is my mission to create more of that in all that I do, whether that is a YouTube video or a book or standing here or talking to you guys out of the carnival. I want that to be the point. That to be my why. So all that being said, it's probably time to introduce myself. Hello, I am Jackie. I'm 25 years old. I have my full brain now. Guess what? That's cool. I, I, there's a lot of pressure on me with that. i got to stop saying it. Uh, so I really like dolphins. Do you guys like dolphins at all? Cool. So I have a tattoo of a dolphin on my head. I got it when I was 16. And I went to this place called Dolphin Camp, which I highly suggest you go in there after this one. Just stop on by when you get down the mountain, okay? I also really like roly polies. You guys know those little black bugs where if you touch them, they curl up in a ball and like freak out? Yeah. Well, I used to collect those in a little bucket, and I would go door to door selling them for a quarter a piece. I profited 25 cents, and I decided right then and there I was going to be an entrepreneur. Took it to the bank. It was great. But I am also really afraid of what people think about me. Sometimes I walk into a room, and I look around, and I think about myself, and I compare myself to everybody else, and all I want to do is like hide in the corner. Sometimes I get so scared of speaking up in intellectual conversations because I'm afraid that uh, whatever I say is going to sound stupid or not, nothing, nothing smart to offer. Sometimes I have days where I feel so painfully depressed that I cannot get out of bed to even make myself a meal. And then sometimes I go days on end without eating real, real meals because I am so afraid of what my body looks like. When I was 17, I learned about this thing that right now I call putting on my mask. You see, this mask was covered with smiles and exciting stories and jokes and questions and just the girl that walked into the room and tried to be the class clown. And I did this because I found that showing myself, showing like how I actually felt was really scary. And so it's much easier to give you guys the introduction of the dolphins and the roly polies than to tell you that I get depressed or I'm scared of people. But what if we were not afraid of what other people thought about us? What if we were able to know who we are and love who we are and have that to offer the world? What if we were able to look ourselves in the mirror and love who we saw staring back at us? I think one of the most powerful things that we can offer the world is our stories. Not just like the really pretty, fun version of like, oh, my favorite color is blue, but actually, what you've been through, what you've learned, why you are the way that you are. I think that that is a really powerful thing, and I know that my life has changed from other people doing so. So, if it's okay with you guys, can I share my story with you? Yes! Thank you. I have the microphone, so, you know. Uh, is anyone out there a little brother or a little sister? Cool. 
cool. Me too. Little sister, we got to stick together. Big brothers and sisters, you guys are cool too, I promise. So, growing up, my big sister was my hero. She was everything that I thought I needed to look like, act like, be like. She was my standard. So I followed her around and I just tried to make myself like her. I forgot about who I actually was because I was trying to make myself look like my big sister. I thought that if I could just be like her, then I'd be good enough, then I'd be okay. I thought that was my standard. But following her around for a while, I never felt like I was able to actually gain her approval, gain the approval of others. And I got really tired of trying to fit into someone else's shoes, and so I decided I wanted to start to try and forge my own path somewhere else. I decided, let's find another place to try to belong. So when I was around 15 years old, I got this job at a place called Texas Roadhouse. Have you guys been there? <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, you know the honey cinnamon butter, like the peanut shells? Yeah, I had to sweep those up, so you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so I started working there, and I started to meet these other friends who did life differently than I did. These were, I guess like the guy on the video was saying, these were the partiers, the drinkers, the kids who did class, the kids who did drugs, and they all seemed really cool to me, and for some reason they liked me. They thought that I was funny, and they wanted me to hang out with them, and I really liked that. I liked feeling wanted. I liked feeling funny and cool. And I realized that I wasn't getting what I thought I needed from home, from my big sister. I wasn't getting that approval to tell me that I was okay there. So I decided, okay, now I'm going to look over here and try and get it from this group of people. So I started hanging out with them, and they thought it was really weird that I had never drank or done drugs or any of that before. They thought that was weird, and I thought to myself, maybe it is weird. These people seem really cool. They like me. Why haven't I done any of that? So about a week goes by, and there I am smoking my first bowl of weed in a church parking lot. Because I just didn't care. I just wanted to belong, so I started making choices like that. And that's kind of what my life became. It was one weekend after the next weekend, and that was how I found my belonging, and that's how I learned that I was supposed to fit in and be cool and make friends. And the more I'd hang out with them, the more I would distance myself from my, my own family. I thought they just didn't understand me. They weren't cool with it. They're going to be over there. I'm going to be over here. It's just who I was going to become. So then I made this new friend at work, and she decided that she wanted to take me under her wing. She wanted to play big sister, she was a little older than me, and she wanted me to be like her sidekick. And she made me feel really special and really important. And we started doing everything together. And I welcomed the idea of another big sister into my life, someone to tell me who I was and make me feel good because I couldn't find it elsewhere. So I jumped under her wing and I was like, let's do this thing. So she started dating this guy, and he was a little bit older than us, so he called me, he also called me his little sister, and I called him my big brother. And before I knew it, the three of us were like a little family. We were doing everything together. We were uh, going shopping together, we were gonna move in together, like it was a whole thing. I trusted them with everything that I had. And so one night after work, because we all worked together at Texas Roadhouse with the peanut shells, we all worked there, and. After work one night, my best friend's boyfriend asked me if I would be his designated driver home from a bar that night that he wanted to go to. And I thought, of course, you're my big brother. Of course I want you to get home safe. I didn't think twice about it, honestly. I just decided, oh, cool, I'll go hang. So we drive over to the bar, and I don't really see him for the rest of the night there. He goes off with his friends, and I'm only 17 at this time, so I'm not old enough to participate. So I'm sitting off to the side at this pool table with uh, some other people from work. And we're hanging out, and I don't see him again, so closing time comes around. It's about 2 a.m. now, and he tells me that he's ready to go. So we go outside, and I take the keys, and I'm about to get in the car, and then he stops, and he's like, no, 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 I'm driving. I'm driving. I'm like the older one. You get in the passenger seat. And I was confused because I was like, that's the whole reason I'm here, was to be your driver. But I trusted him, and I did what he said because I realized you're the older, wiser, you're a big brother. I trust you. So I got in the driver or in the passenger seat, and we're driving away, and I'm watching the lanes, and I'm watching the swerving, and I'm really scared, but I can't do anything for some reason. I just sit there, and I feel frozen. So we pull over, he wants to go into a store to get a drink or something, 
And we get out of the car and I start walking. And before I know it, I'm turned around and there's a hand over my mouth. And I'm confused and I'm scared and I'm like, what is happening right now? But I can't move. And then the door opens. He puts me in the back seat of the car and I was frozen. And that night, my best friend's boyfriend raped me. So I drove home at about four in the morning that night. I drove home and I got upstairs and I went up to my bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't recognize myself anymore. I felt like something was just taken from me. Something was just stolen. Like I wasn't, my body wasn't safe. I didn't belong to myself. I looked at my clothes and my pants, my shoes, and I took them all off and I looked at them and I threw them away because they didn't feel safe anymore either. Nothing was mine. And I could have sworn that I fell asleep on the bathroom floor, but I woke up on the couch downstairs. I woke up to a phone call from him. I was staring at my phone and I was so confused. And I answered the phone and he... He says that he blacked out and he wants me to tell him what happened and he claims to not remember. Sitting here right now, I have a different opinion on that whole scenario, on if he was telling the truth, but at the time, I believed him. So I hung up the phone and I went into a room and I slammed my back against a wall and I fell to the floor and I held my, my knees to my chest so tight because I felt like if I didn't hold myself together then I was going to fall apart. I had never felt more alone and terrified and ashamed in my entire life. I realized that this thing just happened to me, right? This thing, I'm the only person who knows about it. Just me. So I had two choices in front of me. One, I can just, as I said before, put on my mask, go on as normal, pretend nothing happened. Just be best friends with my best friend, her boyfriend, like everything was gonna be fine. And I was just gonna shut it down, and go on as normal and not cause any problems with my story. Or I could choose to tell the truth. And as hard as I tried to keep this down, I, I went to work the next day and I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, I lost it. And so I realized I need to tell the truth. I need someone to know what happened. And so the first person who I think about telling is my best friend. And she's the one who's supposed to be there for me, right? Like, she's like my ride or die, best friend, called myself, or called me her little sister. We were family. She was who I trusted. She was who, she was going to be there for me. So I go outside, and I pick up my phone, and I'm about to dial her number, but for some reason I'm so afraid, because I realize that by me telling her this, this thing that happened to me, by me telling her this, it was going to put her in the position to have to choose. She was going to have to choose between me, her best friend, and the man she loved, who was my abuser. And I did not for one second think that I was worth being chosen. So sometime, or somehow I gathered my courage and I dialed her number. She picks up the phone and I finally get it out of my mouth and I tell her what happened. And she hangs up the phone and she never talks to me again. She chose him. That was a very, very defining moment in my life because I felt like after that happened, nothing was the same. I had never, ever felt more small, more ashamed, more just not a part of myself as I did in that moment. I stepped forward and I just, I didn't want to be around anymore. I didn't want to exist. I wanted to escape because all that was going on in my head was this was your fault, you're wrong, you're bad, you're dirty, you're broken, nobody cares about you. Nobody cares. What, you're, what happened to you, your story, it doesn't matter. And I wanted to run from those thoughts because I didn't know what to do with them. So I remember, oh yeah, drinking is fun. Let's go do more of that. Maybe that will take my mind off of things. So drinking became more than just trying to fit in and be cool. It now became my strategy to survive, my strategy to stay alive because if I was alone in my sober mind with my own thoughts, I didn't want to be alive. So I'd go out, party after party, drinking, drugs, all the things, just running from myself, trying to escape from my own mind. But I felt like it wasn't working. And I felt like I couldn't get far enough away from myself, so I decided, okay, if running mentally isn't going to work, I'm going to run physically. 
So I packed up my car and I remembered, okay, I've always liked dolphins, remember? Dolphins? Always liked them, so I decided I'm gonna move to California. So I pack up my car and I head west. And I get there and I get offered this, this job. I got offered this job in the music world and I was told that if I take this job, then my life is going to turn into world tours and backstage passes and red carpet events and all this stupid fancy stuff that I never cared about. That was never, ever a dream of mine. That was never a part of something I wanted to do, but what it sounded like to me was a perfect escape. A perfect way to not be a part of myself, but to get distracted and lost in something else. So, I say yes. And that is what my life became. But you see, the boss that I had, he was a pretty bad alcoholic. And for my history, that was proving to be a really helpful strategy for me to get away from myself, so I started to participate a bit more with him. And that's when I like to call my downward spiral happened. Night after night, choice after choice, I started to hate myself. I started to just sacrifice everything about who I'd ever been and try and mold myself into a completely different person. If it was what I wore, if it was what I ate, if it was how I acted. I was told, Jackie, you need to look this way. So I decided, okay, then I can't eat this. Jackie, you need to be cool and loose and be able to hang with the guys. So I decided, okay, to do that, I'm just gonna drink more. Or Jackie, your, your emotions and stuff, like you need to just be like the fun party girl. So I shoved that down and that's who I was and I just kept this mask on and I sent in this representative version of myself into the world and that's what I offered. The worst this got, I remember, was waking up uh, the end of a two month tour. I was probably drunk for about seven and a half weeks of them. And I woke up, middle of the night, and I had never felt more ashamed of myself. I hated everything about who I was. And I saw this bottle of rum next to my bed. And the sun was just about to come up, and I was just about to deal with this, not, a, not just like a hangover, but this shame. And I, didn't, I just wanted a day off from that. So I thought, okay, either I can, I can drink this, drink this whole rest of this bottle, and just be done and black out and have a day off from knowing what happens, or maybe, maybe it will be enough to just take my life all together. And in that moment, I realized that I needed help. I, I needed to get out. So I went back home. I laid on this couch for like two weeks straight and I just watched like Friends and Gilmore Girls for two weeks and I just laid there. And I didn't move and I was given this book. And I didn't read at the time, but for some reason I decided maybe this time I should read. So I opened up this book and it's using words that I had never never heard before, like vulnerability, shame, authenticity, all that stuff. I had never heard that stuff, but it, for some reason, I wanted to know more about it. It started to really get my attention. So I'm reading this book, and I realize that this is the first thing that's ever told me that I am okay, and I am, I am loved right now. Like, right in my dirty, broken, self-hating mess, I was loved. And I decided, okay, I want to I wanna take this book seriously. I want to give this a shot. So I quit my music job. I decided I'm going to try and do this instead. So I quit my music job. I move in. That's just what I did. And I started making these new friends. And the first friend that I made, we went out to coffee, and she started, started just sharing stuff about herself with me. And I had never really been in a conversation like that where she's just so open and honest and telling me, telling your story. And she just had no shame about it. She was just telling me what she'd been through, telling me how she felt. And it seemed really cool to me and I really liked that. There was something really attractive about that to me. I was like, you have something that I want. So she started to introduce me to these, these other people and we started all hanging out and I realized that everybody was doing that. Everybody was kind of just sharing their stories and being who they were. And that seemed really cool to me. And so I realized I'm still dragging along this like suitcase full of shame. Like I was still hiding everything. Nobody knew anything. It was all just in here. But I decided that I want to live like they're living. I don't want this anymore because living like they're living 
It's just, it's just not worth it to me to not do that. It's either that or nothing. So I go home, and I think to myself, and I'm terrified because I think, they're my friends right now, but they wouldn't want to be my friends if they knew about all this stuff. Like, they love me, they think they love me, but they only love this version of me. They don't know my story, they don't know what, ha what has happened to me, what I've been through, what I've done, the choices I've made, the damage I've caused. They only love me because they don't know that. But I couldn't handle it anymore. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna do it. So I go to my friend's house and I'm terrified. I am horrified, I'm crying, and I knock on the door, and she lets me in, and for the first time, I share my story with her. <laughs> Five hours, guys, I have a lot to say. I've never told anyone any of this stuff, and I just put it all out there because I think it's just not worth it not to anymore. And I realize that I'm afraid again because, once again, she's in a position to have to choose. Is she gonna choose to love me knowing this stuff or not? And she looks at me and she tells me that she loves me and she gives me a hug and I realize in that moment that I am worth it. That here, right now, I was who I needed all along. I was who I needed the whole time. I realized that all this time I had been running on this hamster wheel of crap just trying to be this person or this person, trying to wear this, this outfit to fit in or trying to make my body look this way or drink this drink. I was sacrificing everything about who I was to try to be this version of someone who I thought this world would love, who I thought would be acceptable. I was so scared of getting hurt again. I was so scared of being rejected, being told that, hey, your story doesn't matter. You don't matter. I was so afraid of that. So I kept the real version of me like locked over here so that she wouldn't get hurt, and I just sent in this fake version out into the world. But I realized that by doing that, the real me wasn't getting any love at all. She was just stuck over here in this corner. But you guys, life is hard. It's not just hard because we're doing it wrong. It's hard because it's hard. And each and every one of you, you have your stories. You have your strategies to survive and things that have happened to you and choices that we all make. And we all have our own suitcase of shame that sometimes we carry around. But I'm learning that shame is a lie. What you have done in your story, they don't define you. And I learned that in that moment, that this whole entire time I was running from myself, but I was who I needed all along. And so I'm unpacking my, my shame suitcase and I'm realizing that I want to look at it with compassion, not judgment. I don't want to look at my story and hate myself for it, but I actually... I want to understand why I did these things. I want to understand what happened to me, why I am the way that I am. Everybody has a mask. Whether that looks like telling jokes, whether that looks like being the big tough guy or the funny guy, the class clown, the sports, the smart. We all have this version that we feel like is a little bit safer to put out into the world, but we're keeping ourselves over here. But I learned that it is so worth it to let who you actually are step forward and into the world because that's what the world needs. The world needs you, the real you, not the polished pretty version, but your actual story because that is what has the power to change things. It's when I hear someone sharing their actual stuff and loving who they are, being brave enough to love yourself because I remember the first time when I looked in the mirror and I wasn't afraid of who I saw. I saw, I saw myself, I felt like for the first time, I saw my face and my hair and my body and I actually, I loved her. And I had never felt that before and that was so powerful. Because guys, we were made for relationship. Just like Scott and John T and Mike have been saying this whole weekend, we're here for connections. Life isn't really worth it or okay without that. But I think that we also really have to learn how to be connected to ourselves. Because I think until we're really able to love ourselves, to look inward at our stories, have compassion for that instead of judgment, be comfortable and at home inside of our own bodies, until we shut off these costumes that we've been trying on, I don't know if we're really able to have that fulfilled relationship, a connection with whoever. We need to bring ourselves to the table. Trauma, depression, anxiety, all that stuff is really real. It's very real. And we have to start taking it more seriously. We have to take care of ourselves, not just our physical health, but like our mental health is so important. It's so important. 
And so some strategies that I have found to replace the other ones. Because I think it's really important to know what to do when you're feeling like you want to run from yourself. Things that aren't going to harm you. And I found that there's a few things that are really helpful. And the first one might sound really simple. But what I found when I'm having one of those really, really dark days is to eat a really good meal. Because what I do sometimes on the dark days is I don't want to eat food. I feel sick. I can't eat food. But what I'm learning lately is that not eating food makes depression worse. And I just learned that, so I'm excited to share it. But on the dark days, I'll eat a good meal. I'll drink some water. And then if that's still not working, what I found is mental health, like trauma, depression stuff, that lives in your, in your brain, not in like your body. So when I'm all in my head like this, I try to get myself out of my head by going and doing something with my body, whether that is petting a dog, whether that's smelling some kind of candle, feeling a soft blanket, do something to get out of your head. And if all of that fails, find someone who you really, really trust and just share with them what's going on. They're not going to always be up the answers to fix you or the advice, but that's not the point. It's just having another human being there to say, hey, you're okay, you're loved, maybe me too, to have someone else in the mess with you. And I know that I'm really lucky to have found friendships like that, and I'm so happy that you guys were here at Riley getting to build that kind of thing. Because those things are really, really going to make a difference. We have got to start being who we are. We have got to start taking off our masks and learning to love ourselves really well. Because you're worth it. Thank you so much. in reading that or watching videos, all my stuff is up on the screen there, and also I would be honored and so excited to come speak at your school, so feel free to send me an email if that is something that you'd be interested in. Thank you. Excellent. Awesome. And, you know, thankfully for uh, Jackie, she didn't get my... Uh,